So let us begin, ladies and gentlemen, our journey. Okay. Um, thank you very much for all of your contributions. I'm so grateful for your, your time. Okay. Um, right. Um, so our journey begins here with the issue of MCMC. And, and this is a presentation I delivered uh, some years back, um, 2013, I think it was, with uh, Dr. Jishin Liu uh, here at Math and Stats, who is just incredibly talented computational statistician and a uh, extraordinary collaborator who really worked with me to um, apply these methods to dynamic modeling and then in countless hours apply PMCMC, getting it through my, my thick, thick cranium. Um, so we're going to be using an example here, which is also drawn from dynamic modeling. So that understanding that we built up yesterday for particle filter about dynamic models will come over here. But these techniques will be applicable much outside of dynamic modeling. MCMC techniques and indeed PMCMC techniques can be more broadly useful, but, but MCMC don't even have to involve time, okay? Um, and um, traditionally, when we have a problem, be it statistical, let's say a Bayesian, net, a Bayesian network, um, Bayesian hierarchical network or graphical model. Or if we have a um, dynamic model, a model that simulates a system over time like those SIR models, it's very typical that within these models that we'll have parameters which make this model specific to a certain context or, or um, precisely specify um, the assumptions uh, associated with different areas of the model. And within statistics and within dynamic modeling, we have ways of estimating those parameters. Some of them with which you may be familiar are things like um, uh, maximum likelihood estimation. Um, uh, there's also approaches with um, uh, e the whole class of EM algorithms, uh, uh, expectation maximization, um, particularly dealing with, uh, with uh, data that is um, less well, um, uh, where there's missing data. Um, often these yield point estimates, meaning specific values estimated for a parameter, okay? Um, and yet, we often know that, um, that uh, given the data's uh, uncertainties, problems with data quality and so on, often we don't have enough data to really pin it down, to put all our eggs in the basket of one estimate for a parameter. Um, often we're interested from a Bayesian standpoint about, about not taking a stand on one value for the parameter but um, allowing ourselves to consider a, a, a range of possibilities. And um, maybe it's a normal distribution centered at a value and with a certain standard deviation and a certain mean. Um, in other cases, it may be a weird bimodal distribution or what have you. And it's not always obvious when we have empirical data and we want to we want to specify what are the values of the parameters implied by that data it's not always an easy thing to know okay if we move beyond point estimates to a distribution um, what is the distribution that's implied if we make a normal normality assumption um, Often we can just estimate two parameters, mu and sigma, or similarly for log normal, et cetera. But if we have a general distribution, it's, it's often hard to, hard to do that, hard to, to specify that, and hard to sample from that. That's one problem we're dealing with, coming up with estimates for parameters that avoid putting all our eggs in one basket or assuming a strict distributional form like a normal distribution 
and instead being open to something more general. That's one type of problem we're going to be dealing with here. A second type, to do justice for those on this side of the room, a second type of problem is something, whoa, um, that's something where there could be an exciting level of uh, acceleration even if you're sitting. Um, uh, a second type of problem has to do with, um, I see, it's missing ideas for So, pardon me when I get that out of the way. It exhibits a mechanism, okay. Um, so a second, a second problem that we're gonna be dealing with with these methods is one that you may never have thought twice about. So humor me for this. It will give you an intuition for some aspects of what we saw yesterday and some aspects of, of what we've seen this afternoon. Suppose that you have a need. You're in front of your computer and you don't have access to R or Anaconda, Python, et cetera. And you want to sample from a distribution, okay? Um, maybe you do have access to some simple libraries and so on, which provide you with a, maybe the ability to sample from a uniform distribution. You know, a distribution where, where um, for some range, maybe between zero and some value uh, x, you have a certain uniform probability density of getting that. You're sampling continuous values here. You roll a, uh, a random, you, you use a random number, and you, you basically call up to this, this to this uh, function, and or turn to you random values between zero and x drawn from continuous line. Are you comfortable with that idea? Okay. Now let's imagine this. Imagine that you don't have a flat distribution, but you want to draw instead from an, an arbitrary distribution. Maybe it also goes between zero and x, okay? Um, how, do, how do I draw a value from that arbitrary distribution? How do I, how do I sample from this distribution? This is a PDF, so it's got to integrate to one, right? Um, uh, in other words, uh, the value has to come from somewhere here, and um, this describes all the possibilities. And I want to find something that, that a sample from this that is more likely to be drawn from this region, because the probability, is, probability density is higher than it is from here. But there's some possibility it could come from here. It's just a lot more of them, if I keep on drawing, will tend to come from here. How do I sample from that? I mean, it may seem like a weird question. Well, Okay, it's an arbitrary shape. How, how do I draw a value from a, a distribution that has an arbitrary shape? And there's a couple tricks when it's unidimensional. When it's unidimensional like this, there's one dimension, one axis here. There's a, there's a fairly easy way to draw from it. Does anyone know it? Anyone know how to do that? They actually used to, as, as part of uh, doctoral exams in uh, the department from which I graduated, MIT's EECS department, for doctoral candidates, they would ask them to demonstrate how you draw from that and show why it works mathematically. Come up with a formula by which to, to uh, draw from it and show mathematically why it's drawn. Um, so that, that's something you needed to do in order to, to pass this exam. Anyone know how to draw from that for the interdimensional? It's actually fairly straightforward. Basically what you do is you integrate it, okay? So you create the cumulative distribution uh, for this. And then you draw a number between zero and one, and you just look up at what value of this distribution what value along this axis does the cumulative value match that value between zero and one? It can be shown that if you do that, you can pick a value here and, and you will get, uh, be drawing values from this distribution. But it turns out if you're dealing with multiple dimensions, that nice trick becomes really awkward. And so there's a bunch of ways in statistics we deal with this. One of them we dealt with yesterday. What was that? Does anyone remember? I mentioned it. 
in passing, it's important sampling. Okay, so important sampling. And that was the basis of, does anyone remember what in particle filtering? It's the basis of the begins with W, ends with a T. Weights. That was the basis of the weight. So we want to sample from this target distribution X. And we have a proposal distribution Y. And what we actually do is a two-step procedure. And it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. It works in any number of different dimensions. Two-step procedure, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so the first thing we do is we draw from the proposals. You make the proposal as easy as possible, like a uniform distribution. So we draw from A. We draw from Q of X. We have a library that can give us values from a uniform distribution. So we draw from that. Hmm? And then what we do is we compute a weight. A weight for that thing we've drawn. So we, we suppose that we sample 1,000 times from Q of X, maybe 10,000, maybe 100,000 times. And for each of those values, we compute a weight W of X. And W of X equals something that's going to be higher if this value should have more oomph because it's something that's more seen in the target distribution than this. So this is actually given by P of X over Q of X. Okay? So the idea is look. And then you, well, okay, so this weights, and then you normalize it so it's they sum to one. But then you draw, you draw from these thousand that you sampled, each label with a weight, with a probability according to their weight. So something that is twice the weight is twice as likely to be drawn. And that's easy to do with the cumulative distribution, too. And the things that are weighted more highly will be more sampled, and therefore, between the two steps of the procedure, you'll be sampling things more here than you will here, because their weights are higher. Because P, value of P, that density over Q, is high here. You'll be, their weights will be higher, and therefore you'll sample them. The first step, we just sample from Q, and then we label them with a weight according to this ratio. The second step, we draw from those things we already sampled with a probability not equal across all of them, but proportional to the weight. And so we end up sampling in that second step from this area, where Q or P is greater than X, or is greater than Q, than we do from Q. From, uh, from this area where P is less than Q. Excuse me on this area here, because these have low weight. Why? Because P of X divided by Q of X is very low. And so these samples will be underrepresented in that second step of sampling. These will be overrepresented. And you get out this nice distribution. Collectively, between those two steps, doing the first step drawn from Q, a whole swack of particles. A million, if you want, 10 million. Computers pretty fast these days. Label each of them according to that ratio, and then draw from those according with a probability according to the weight, with probability drawing each proportional to that weight, and you get you got something that gives you that 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 samples from that distribution, and it's sweet, and it's not even incomplete. Okay, so so this is this is a, a way to sample from this, but it's not the only way statisticians have been mentioned. Statisticians can be brilliant. Another way that they've met is something called rejection sampling, which involves, again, considering uh, a, a ratio, considering a maximum value of this, and that's another way I won't go into. But today, I'm going to talk about a third way. And that is, so yes, there was important sampling. I'll come back to that. It's told me I've made my 10,000 steps. Uh, so, Today we're going to be talking about MCMC. And what MCMC is going to do is it's going to provide us also a way to sample from P of X. P of X can be a huge number of dimensions, 20 dimensions. We can still sample from it. As long as we can compute P of X, we can 
sample from it via this algorithm MCMC. And we'll do that by sort of walking over it and concentrating, spending more of its time in areas that are oversampled and less time in areas that, are, that have low P of X. And it will walk around. So that's going to be key to what we're doing. And in both cases, it's ways of sampling from this distribution. And what does that distribution have to do with this one? That distribution, P of X, is this thing. It's this thing we're trying to sample from involving parameter values because we're trying to know what's the shape of our distribution involving our parameter values. Okay? Okay. Beautiful stuff. Okay, so we're moving beyond simple calibration where we're, we're just trying to arrive at point estimates and trying to get distributions here. So imagine we have a model and um, we have a model where, this is a dynamic model. It needn't be for, PM, for MCMC, it's just, this is kind of, this is what we work with a lot and this is about some case studies which use this. And we have certain parameters that we don't know. Maybe it's a C up there, um, which is associated with the mixing. And maybe it's a P, which is the probability a given case will be reported, okay? It's not actually part of these differential equations. It's relating uh, this term, the number of people ill, to, the, uh, uh, to how many cases were reported, okay? Um, and uh, I had noted that traditional ways of estimating parameters like with calibration uh, or maximum likelihood estimation you have pretty poor, they have a lot of limitations as far as estimating things. Um, so here we're going to be arriving at this posterior distribution, a distribution for parameters in light of the data in the model structure there's some distribution implied for parameter values. And this is gonna give that, give us that. It might look like this. It might be not just a distribution for each parameter. That was for one parameter, like maybe, you know, for parameter A or something like this. This is P of A, probability distribution. But in general, we're gonna have joint parameter distributions. Joint in the sense that we can consider multiple parameters at once, a vector of possible parameter values, one for P, one for C, and they're not independent of each other. This is a marginal one. This is just for A by itself, but in general, maybe it's the case that, well, you know, C can be large or it can be small, but if C is large, P is gonna, tends to be very small. And if, if P is large, C tends to be very small. This is a density plot. You can think of this as kind of a mountain range running along here. And the mountains <coughs> are taller where it has more probability of occurring, right? Um, so there's very little samples up here. The samples tend to be concentrated either up here with high, pretty high C and low P or way up there with high P and low C. So in short, either there's a lot of mixing going on, a lot of cases getting infected, and not much reporting of them. That's this kind of preaching. Or there's, there's little mixing, little transmission going on, but very high probability of it being reported. And that's a very real quandary, right? You look at data coming in a number of new cases of an infection, and you shouldn't leap to the conclusion, oh, it's because more people are getting infected. Maybe it's because they're being reported more. They're the same number of people, it's just more likely to be reported. So here, you often have these quandaries in interpreting data. What's giving rise to this? Why do we see that? Okay? That's what models help us probe. So we're going to introduce some notation. It's going to involve Greek letters. Okay? I hope you're all comfortable with that. And the key letter is going to be theta, which is going to denote the probability of the uh, parameters here. And uh, theta is going to consist of two parameters. It's just a parameter vector. It labels the parameter, it, it's, a, it's a clumping in a vector, a single vector of uh, two parameters. So the, the first element is C and the second is P. And we'll have lots of possible thetas. You know, one possible theta um, would be one with high P and low C. Another possible theta would be one with fairly high C and low P. Right? Um, 
And we could have different thetas. You know, this would be a different theta than that one. It would be all these different thetas that are possible. Theta bundles together C and P in a single nice notation. Okay, so it, it sort of captures both of them. Okay, um, so MCMC is a principled way of generating samples for these thetas from some distribution. So we can sample from this guy. Remember I, I told you here, this guy was just a univariate distribution, but if it was in like 20 dimensions, it would be hard for me to write, um, hard for me to draw it. And, and yet we often want to sample from things that are multidimensional. And this provides us with a way to do so, MCMC, okay? Markov chain Monte Carlo. And we, we will draw not just one value, but a bunch, because we want to see the ensemble. We want to see the full, you know, an approximation to the distribution. Once we start filling in not just one sample, but two, but four, but eight, but 16, but 32, 4, 64, 128, 256, 512, 102, well, I'd love to go on, but um, we could start to fill in this distribution, right? Start to fill in that distribution, what it looks like. You start getting a real feel for what the distribution looks like via sampling, right? And, um, and here, we're going to be sampling from these distributions for different values for parameters. And if we have a model for them, be it a Bayesian, you know, a Bayesian hierarchical model or be it a, um, a simulation model, we could run that for different ones and, and see uh, the output, see the, the implications, okay? Um, and we're going to use a Markov chain to generate the samples. The Markov chain is going to allow us to try to sample from this P of X by moving back and forth here with different values of X, sometimes repeating the same one for a while. Good ones will tend to be repeated a bunch and it will kind of move around. And the Markov chain will be kind of where it currently is at. Its state of the Markov chain is where it's at right now. And it will move around left and right, okay? Um, okay, so there's a couple pieces to MCMC here. We're, we need to come up with, to run MCMC, we need to come up with a prior distribution. Um, do we have any guess for what this looks like? That, Certain values are more likely than others, if so, we can characterize it with the prior. It's prior in the sense that it's prior to encountering the data. We're doing it blind to the data. What, what guesses do we have for what the values of, of x might be, or a over here, okay? Um, and then we'll have likelihood formulae that, that indicate, basically, the likelihood of if if say A has a certain value, okay, or theta has a certain value, C and T, what's the likelihood you would have observed the empirical data? So the first thing, prior distribution is blind to the data. We, we formulate it before we see the data. It's prior to the data. The second one is how we engage with the data. So once we have a particular value of theta, okay, think that's it? You think it's that value of C and that value of P, um, well, for that set of values of C and P, what's the likelihood? If you assume that, what would be the likelihood you would see the empirical data? Maybe it's one data point, maybe it's a whole sweep of them. And that's what the likelihood gives us. For a given value of theta, it gives us a number, uh, a, a real number that specifies the likelihood for that theta that we would observe the empirical data. Now, for those who do modeling, you should recognize that with a simulation model, to compute that likelihood requires running the simulation model on that theta, running it on that value of C and maybe that value of P here, and getting a result out and seeing from the results of the simulation model, what's the likelihood given that number of people infected, for example, that you would see this data, this empirical data, okay? So here, theta is going to be something that, to, to understand the likelihood, we might have to do something big. In other cases, it'll be very simple to say, you'll go directly from the, from the theta to, to an understanding of what the likelihood is. And then, there's going to be an implicit uh, application of Bayes' rule 
to go from a likelihood and a prior to flip it around and get a posterior. And we'll, we'll see that. And then, having done this, having got all these in place, MCMC is going to be this key algorithm that's going to generate betas. It's going to pull betas successively um, according to this distribution, pulling them more for regions with high, high posterior and, and low for other regions. It's going to gravitate towards the regions that are high, but still explore the space. It's going to spend some time in low probability regions, low posterior, but it's going to it's going to spend more time in other regions. And when it's spending time there, it's emitting data. It's emitting thetas. And collectively, they're going to approximate that distribution. Okay, um, So that's the, the basic gist of it. Let's go through each of these. So prior, we're going, to, we're going to have a prior. Often we use very simple priors. The most classic one is a uninformative or minimally informative prior, a uniform prior. We just say, we don't know what it is. It could be anything in this range. Go figure. Or you just say, it could be anything anywhere. It's, it's not even a, it's not even a, uh, a distribution that, that sums to one. You say, any value is equally good. You, you can do that by just setting the prior to be one, regardless of the value. Okay? But sometimes we want to express the prior. We want to say, we think it's norm. I mean, it's. Uh, our, our judgment is it's centered at this point, and maybe it's a normal distribution at that point. Generally, the, the evidence from the data will overwhelm the prior at some point. If you get enough data items, the prior will no longer be important. It won't be very sensitive to the prior, but you, you'd like a place to start, and this provides you. Maybe it's a triangular distribution centered where you wanted it. It's, it generally, it's not that important, but it, it might give it a hint a whisper of where it should look, especially. And over, eventually, um, and pretty quickly, the data just overwhelms, the evidence from the data overwhelms it. OK. Um, so I'm, I'm concentrating here on Bayesian MCMC, which is, 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 is uh, not the only type around. Um, you can also do it without a prior, but that prior gives us extra, extra capacity. OK. Um, so here we're going to have two parameters of interest. and. Uh, we actually examined two, two priors here. One prior that was 1 over 50 between C from less than 1 over 50 and, and uh, between P, uh, 0 and 1 for P, 0 otherwise. And we also gave it a misleading prior that was deliberately off. It was like deliberately off the true values we knew to, to obtain because it was simulation, simulated data. Then we have to formulate a likelihood function. The likelihood function gives here the probability of observing a given data item, that's the y, given a theta. So given some assumption about, um, about, about theta, about the values of the parameters, it says, for that value of the parameter, what would the likelihood be that you would observe the observed data, y? Okay, so it says, hey, we have this value of theta here, C and P. What's the probability we would observe the, the empirical data that we observe? Okay? That's what the likelihood function does. That's its job in life, is, <coughs> is to compute that, that, that uh, value of the likelihood. It says, how likely is it we would see this data given this assumption for the parameter values? Okay? Um, and in general, you want to have different formulations. Um, if you have. Um, more than one uh, parameter, for example, um, you uh, you might have uh, some components of likelihood based on each. In this case, we have a simulation model that we're going to run based on C, the component of theta that gives C, which is the contact rate. And from the results of that model, we are going to then say, okay, what is the probability, when we ran the model with that value of C, we get out a value of the number of infected at a given time. And given that number of infected people, the value of P, which is the probability of each of these infected people is reported, we will ask, what's the, what's the probability 
that these two, the true number of effective and the probability would imply, would yield the number of people reported equal to y, this number of people reported at that time. And we do so at each time, as given by i. And we do so with, with a binomial uh, distribution. This is a binomial distribution, and the density of the binomial distribution. It's actually well, a probability of a, it's not a probability of density, it's a probability, because um, it's discrete. And, and so we're asking, for each data point, y, successively, what's the probability we would observe that if we ran the model with the value of c implied by theta and the value of p implied by theta, and we multiply all of these, each of these is a probability for a certain point in time of observing that data for that point in time, given the value of c in theta and given the value of p in theta, and by taking that probability for each point in time that where we have observed data, y, we multiply all of them, we get a probability for observing y as a whole given theta. So theta gives us the, the p and it gives us the c by which we run the model. And, and then with that combination, we judge the, the probability of observing y at a given point based on the i for that point that comes out of the simulation model, we take that probability and we multiply it over all the observations, computing this for each of the observations, we multiply them up, that's the pi, the product, and we get the probability of observing all the observations given this particular theta, this particular p and this particular c that went into computing that. That's the idea here, and, and this is it written out in, in, um, in, according to discrete mathematical terms. Um, so this is actually running the simulation model. That's running the simulation model. Do my students appreciate that? Okay. This is running the simulation model on C in this data. So we're trying to figure out what's likely we would observe this empirical data given theta. Theta, theta includes both C and P. Remember that? Um, Theta includes C and P. So a given theta implies a certain value for C, a certain value for P, and for those certain values of those, we will compute the product of the binomial values of the binomial probability distribution for each for each observable given the value of the simulation at that point in time and the value of P, where the value of the simulation is run with the value of C from theta. Mm. Okay. Um, and next, so that's our likelihood. If this weren't a simulation model, if this were a Bayesian uh, network or a Bayesian linear model, all you would do is you would, you would run that network given the values from theta. Here there's C and P, there might be other things, but you run it on that and you use it to assess the probability that we're network, the probability of observing this value y that you've observed. So it, it just translates directly here. The simulation model is part of it, OK? And then you apply Bayes' rule. This is, I don't know if any of you remember Bayes' rule. Do, do you remember Bayes' rule? The result of that question is ambiguous. Um, uh, so. Bayes' law, Bayes' rule, okay? Um, so if we want to compute the probability, this is this has these discrete symbols in it and so on, the theta and y, but this is a general feature uh, of, from Bayesian mathematics, and that's why Bayes, um, the creator, the envisioner of much of Bayesian mathematics. So P of A given B, the probability of A given B is equivalently given as probability of B given A times the probability of anyone? A. Good. Divided by the probability of B. And why is that? Well, amongst other things, when you multiply this, this is P of A, B, right? And P of A, B divided by P of B is, guess what? P of any given B. Yeah. Huh? It's just gotta be. It's gotta be. Um, 
So, so base rule states this, this nice feature. And that looks perhaps unimpressive, though to me it looked beautiful. Um, but here it's of great significance because what is P of A given B? Well, it's, it's P of theta given Y. What, what is this thing? What, what, what did I call that earlier? That's the posterior probability. So given the data, that's the probability that a given value of theta obtains, that it's a given value of theta. What is this guy here? What is probability, this, this one over here, the probability of B given A? What is, what is probability of Y given theta? We, that's the likelihood function. So given a certain value of theta, what's the probability you would observe the empirical data of Y? And what is P of theta? Well, it's the prior distribution. OK? Now, I can comment on the denominator, but the key thing is, if we want to consider this as a function of theta, we, we want to say, OK, what's the value of theta? We have a fixed one. We have given to us from the world. <coughs> the card has been handed to us of y. y is some predicted value. Um, we don't have to worry about this. The point is, this thing on the left is proportional to that, divided by some constant. This is some constant. We don't particularly have to care what it is, p of y. It's, y has been given to us. It's fixed. We don't have to worry about varying it. It's not something we're varying y. We're asking for a given y that we've been granted, that we've been given from the world, what's the probability that we have a, a given theta that explains it compared to any other one? And so this thing on the left is just proportional to this. It's, it's just this thing over a constant. And we don't really care what the constant is, because it's a constant. <coughs> so no matter what value of theta we consider, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this thing is proportional to this. Now, this is radical. I guess young people would say rad. <laughs> it's rad, man. Um, this, this is, this is. This is radical because we want this. We want the posterior, but we have, who creates the prior? Who, who do I have to ask to get the prior? I create the prior. I choose the prior. Remember I said it could be triangular, it could be some sort of normal distribution. What is this? That's the li li likelihood function. Who, who chooses this? I choose it. I choose it, right? And, 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 and I can give it. And in fact, I just did give it. It was that, you may not think it's beautiful, but, but at least give it credit. This is the likelihood here. We chose it. Now, in our case, it actually involves implicitly running a, the simulation model, but that's fine. In other cases, it would involve running base nets or whatever. But the point is, we can readily get this. Can readily get this, and and jointly that's going to give us our theta, our our, our 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 p of theta given y, which is our posterior, which is what we're trying to sample from. That's this guy here, p of x. That's this guy here. We're sampling from the posterior. We're sampling. Gosh, almost makes me want to cry sometimes. It's so beautiful. We're sampling from the possible values, the probability of the possible values of these parameters. We don't know what the values are, but as they're implied by the observables, this, this, this y, we, we get this y, and, and this tells us what the shape of this distribution is, the probability at any given theta, what's the probability of that obtaining given the evidence that we have. So this tells us how to compute, compute p of y. In a general, y might be could be only one thing, like A, just different values of one parameter. Uh, in our case, it was C and P, so it's, it's two-dimensional. In general, it could be 10 dimensions. But the point is, given this, we could draw out these curves that I've shown, right? I mean, conceptually, we could, we could draw it out. And, oh my gosh, 
oh my gosh, then we could sample from it using these techniques that I've, I've told you about, right? We can, we can go through and do this sort of sampling where it's been more time where it's, it's high probability. And that's what we're going to do next. Guess what, folks? That's where we're going. That's where we're going, okay? So we, we want to sample from this guy here. We have the prior. We have the like. We want to sample from, um, excuse me, from, from this guy here this guy here, okay? And we're gonna use a Markov chain to sample from it, okay? So here in the Markov chain, this is kind of the last step here. This is the MCMC step. Markov chain is used to generate samples. And it's just gonna wander over this landscape and it's gonna spend more time in the areas that have high posterior probability, high P of theta given Y, and less in the areas that have less. It's gonna go there sometimes, but it's it's going to go back, okay? Uh, it's going to go back to the higher, higher uh, density regions, okay? So that's that's what this next step is. We're diving into this now. This MCMC, mm -hmm. um, and I got to watch the time here, but soon we'll be on to PMCMC. Okay. So, so here, what we're going to do is we're going to draw an initial candidate value of theta, which as long as it's non-zero is fine, okay? Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry. This is within a loop. I'm, I'm, I'm Let's see if it's the same initial value. No, we're gonna we're gonna be in a marker chain. We're gonna be in this kind of loop, and we're gonna wander around here. And basically, we're gonna draw wherever we are. We're at a certain point theta, okay? And we're gonna draw a candidate to go to next, okay? And we're either gonna accept or reject that candidate. So maybe maybe right now we're. This is scary. Is this okay? This is a highlighter. I wanted a different color, but I'm afraid that would damage the board. Um, okay. Um, so maybe we're we're right here right now. Okay. And we're at a certain value of theta. Um, and so we're in its Markov chain. We have a certain state in the chain, a certain place in the chain. And and here we're going to draw a candidate by perturbing this, by drawing something kind of nearby, but uh, you know, some distance off. Maybe we draw it from a normal distribution centered at this point, but with a certain standard deviation. We have this candidate. So this is theta. This is going to be theta star, the candidate. It's the thing we're considering. And this candidate, we're going to compute the posterior for it by by taking this candidate and computing the prior of the candidate and then the prior, and then the likelihood of observing the data for the candidate. And by multiplying those, we're going to get, by Bayes' rule, something proportional to what? To the posterior. That's the Bayes' rule. You multiply prior by the likelihood, you get something that's proportional to the posterior. And you will then either accept or reject it based on the ratio between this and the current value, the theta here. Okay, so we're going to draw a candidate. We're going to compute basically this P of Y given theta, theta star. I don't like how I, how I wrote that down because uh, we, should, we should really make it draw a candidate th value theta star, just to make it very clear. And this should be theta star here. Um, and uh, to, to just be clear that we're dealing with a candidate, not the current value, okay? Um, uh, okay, so, so this is what we're, what we're doing. We're computing for this candidate what the value of the um, of the posterior is there compared to the value here. We take their ratio. And if that ratio is greater than one, we go to the candidate value. We shift our position in the Markov chain to the candidate. We go to the candidate. That's our new position in the Markov chain. And we emit the value of the, the candidate. That's our output. If we reject it, like maybe maybe um, the value of, of the probability, the posterior probability of theta is a lot less than the current value, um, 
If it's less than the current value, we'll roll a dice um, between zero and one, and if it's, if it's less than that ratio, we'll still go there. Um, but if it's greater than the ratio, we won't go there. We'll just re-emit the value of theta from where we are, and we'll stay where we are. We'll re-emit it. We'll repeat it because we're at a good place. We're at one that's pretty, pretty high compared to other things. And we keep on doing this. Some candidates we accept and we move there. Some we reject. We stay where we are. We emit the current place. Okay. Um, we accept or reject, and, and we keep on going through it and emitting things. This is how we sample from the distribution. Those are the samples from the distribution. Okay. Um, and generally, we'll need to do this for a burn-in time for a while. Maybe it's a thousand steps, a thousand samples before we start paying attention to them. So we forget where we started. We forget the vagaries of the initial state. Um, okay. Um, so what you end up doing is, is, is sampling from values of these distributions. In this case, they're fairly independent, actually. They, that's why they look round. C versus P in this case. Um, so we're sampling from them, but there's a little bit of structure. It's got a little bit more sort of vertical variability than, than horizontal. And we just sample. This is a density plot. It's like a it's like, like, like Mount Vesuvius rising here to its peak, right? Um, and, um, and we're using this to sample uh, from the implied values of C and P in light of the evidence why okay um okay um i'm not gonna uh dwell on this thing um so now i had thought that i had a nice um uh yeah it's in that that other uh presentation on on mcmc that i um that i described the the steps so this is how the markov chain works um i will actually go and show you the other formulation in case it will be just a little bit helpful to see it framed in a different way. Um, here we go. This is another, another one. I think I shared this with you as well. Here we go. Okay, so this is called the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, and I've written it down a little bit more formally here, okay? Um, we pick an initial value for, for theta. And until we converge, as judged by some, some quantity, we um, pick a value for a perturbation. So we have some value of theta right now, and we pick some sort of distance from it. And we, we use that to get a candidate value. Oh man, I call this theta arrow tilde. OK, it's the star, OK? Um, and we create that, and we compute the posterior at that value. That's theta star, posterior at theta star. So the value of this function here versus at our current point here. Okay? And we consider the ratio. If this ratio is greater than 1, in other words, if this value at the candidate, the posterior at the candidate, is greater than this one, we always go there. And we adopt that as a new position theta star, and we emit it, okay? That's, we, we use that candidate as the official value to be output from here, otherwise we use the, we just repeat where we are. So if we had picked a perturbation, let's say, maybe another time we're at this point theta, and we pick something down here, right? And now this is where we are, theta, and this is where we, our candidate value, Right? And here, the ratio for the, the posterior for the candidate point versus where we are now is less than 1. And so we don't always go there, but we go there with a certain probability of that ratio. Maybe the ratio is, you know, 5, 6, something like that. And so we roll a, remember, we draw a number between 0 and 1. Uh, a pseudo random number, and if it's less than five six, we accept and we go there, even though it's less. If it's more than five six, we don't, we reject it. Okay, that's what this uniform <coughs> is. 
and then we emit that, and we can't put it. Now, why do we emit it? Because we are sampling from this distribution. The whole point is to output these possible values of thetas, these candidate values of thetas, where collectively they approximate this distribution. So if we stack them up, right? We, we stack them up. And they don't have to make that sound, um, but you know, you, you stack them up and they're gonna approximate something kind of like, like this distribution. You know, you sample enough of them and they're gonna pile up in a way that approximates this distribution, right? That's the idea here. We're sampling from these distributions according to this algorithm. And we typically do so for thousands, nay, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of times. And we sample from the values of these parameters. So big picture, what are we doing? A lot of detail. What are we doing here? We're taking evidence. Why? Evidence from the world. Why? We have some sort of model that tells us about how certain parameters relate to that evidence. How with some parameters, theta, that evidence is more likely to be plausible. With some parameters, theta, that evidence is less likely to be plausible, as given by a, a likelihood function. And we have some prior distribution for theta that sort of before seeing the data, it's our guess as to what data is. And what this algorithm does, it basically tells us what the probability distributions are for theta in light of what that data is telling us in the model captured in the relationships about the likelihood tells us. So if we, if we consider the model and we have this data what this algorithm is doing is it's telling us, oh, you have that data? Well, with this model, this is what that implies for the distribution of possible values for theta. This is what it means about what theta is. And it's not just one value. After all, that's what we're trying to get away from. It's a distribution of possible values. And it's a distribution over theta, and therefore it's a joint distribution over the components of theta. C and P, for example, or 20 different components. So this provides us a way of taking evidence from the world, having a model, be it a Bayesian hierarchical model, a, a, uh, a you know, graphical model of some sort, a, a model associated with a linear regression, et cetera, anything that we can use to give us a likelihood, including a dynamic model, a simulation model. And this provides us a way of saying that data from the world, this is what it implies for parameter values. Does that make sense? It, it's, it, it like lets us, lets us take this data from the world and transform it into seeing what it implies about these parameter values. It entails, it, it constrains our possible understanding of those parameter values. Certain parameter values are more plausible than others. Does that make sense? That is the gist of, PMC, of, of MCMC. It's data from the world, it gives us understanding of parameter values. And using that understanding of parameter values, we can do all sorts of things. We can run the model with different <coughs> parameter values and see its implications. Like maybe for a dynamic model. Now, for a dynamic model, for those who, who are interested in those things, you do this for a deterministic dynamic model. Okay? Deterministic model. Um, okay. Time runs short, but I'd like to get on to PMCMC, and I'd like to do so with the opioid example. May I do so? Okay, seeing no tomatoes. Maybe because my glasses are off, um, I'll, I'll continue, okay? Um, uh, so, so that was a glimpse of MCMC. Now I want to talk about PMCMC. So I, before I do this, I want to reflect on something. I want to reflect jointly on something. Ladies and gentlemen, yesterday we saw in this very room particle filtering. Particle filtering, I, I said, 
Now remember, it was a way of taking data from the world as well. And we had a model. And I was like, it's a model. And I told it, I told you it, it was a survival of the fittest. These different hypotheses about what was going on competed. Remember that idea? The ones that are more fit continued on, the ones who are less fit died out. So, so that too was, was telling us something about things in the model. Was it telling us about the value of fixed parameters? No. Yesterday's talk about particle filtering, it completely glossed over, it abstracted over differences in parameter values. The particles differed not in their assumptions about fixed parameters. They differed in their assumptions about model state, the situation right now in the model, which included some dynamically varying things we call parameters that were part of model state. But really, it, it, it didn't get into particles that had different hypotheses about parameter values, because that's not allowed in particles. That's, that, you, you can't do that mathematically, legitimately, in particle filter. Where you can do that, where you can have particles competing, not, not only have particles competing in terms of their understanding of model state, for the most competitive understanding about how many people are sick out there, how many people are susceptible, all those sort of things, but also with, with different competing understanding as to values of parameters is PM CGC. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to give you at least a glimpse of that, if I may, in an application to opioid. Okay? So I'm going to do that right now. And um, uh, with your leave, um, I am going to call up my uh, particle MCMC slides here and, and talk about it. So, so what is particle MCMC? Particle MCMC gives us the best of MCMC sampling parameter values, going from data about the world and saying, what does it imply about our assumptions in the model? Not the latent state of the model, but our assumptions about model parameters, about things like what fraction are reported, or about things like what's the contact rate, as fixed quantities. It's constant quantities. That's what MCMC does. It lets us take data from the world and give it a model structure. It tells us what that implies. Uh, it whispers to us about the plausible values of, of parameters. Can't particle filtering does so in the context. It allows, it whispers to us about the underlying situation of the model, of model state, in light of that evidence over time. And particle MCMC is going to give us both. We're going to be able to have parameters in our model that are fixed, a model that depends on them, and some stochastics in model state which need to be estimated. And a very interesting thesis from MIT in the 1970s showed that actually we can get much better evidence out about the values of parameters if we are correcting for our understanding about the model state underlying the system. So actually, Doing that together, is, it gives something that's where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Doing them together is synergies. You actually can get better parameter estimates, tighter parameter estimates out, because you are estimating the underlying state of the system. Okay, um, And that's what PMCMC is going to give us. And it's gorgeous. So basically, it's going to support estimating not just parameter values, not just the state of the model at a given time, but parameter values jointly with trajectories over time of a system, okay? Um, and it's gonna be giving us different, as it were, guesses as to the, the, the parameter values that apply in the model and what the true situation in the model is over time. That's a trajectory. Okay, it's very computationally expensive, but not prohibitively so. It's a good match to public health where we might get data, you know, once a day, a couple times a day, and it's highly parallelizable. And uh, Duan Rujiet um, in our lab is doing some wonderful work with GPUs 
paralyzing it. And Winchell, in his normal uh, strategically insightful fashion, has also um, uh, stirred up an impetus to do this with FPGAs, these field programmable beta rates, which, are, which could really speed this up. Um, and I want to credit also uh, uh, Li Xiaoyan and, uh, and also Zeru here for, uh, for their contributions to, to the PMCMC context and, and the code base. So there's a whole family of algorithms for this. This is gnarly stuff. Uh, it took me a while to grok it. Um, and we have a very nice code base for doing this with dynamic models that we will be improving on. So the basic deal is we're sampling, we're taking data about the world. Where's my pointer? Ah, there it is. Um, maybe I can get it to 20,000 today. Okay. Um, so we're taking data from the world and we're saying, we want to understand what it implies in terms of parameter values and underlying situation of the model, not just at one point in time, but over time, from time one to time two. And the basic idea here is, look, I'm going to give you the flavors here. I, I can't you know, go through all the details of this. There's just not the time, particularly given that I want to look at the opioid model. OK, so we find initial values of parameters, OK? Uh, and this is kind of a brute force thing often. We, we find some initial parameters that will give us, um, uh, that will allow us to perform particle filtering and get at least some trajectory that is a non-zero path. Mumble. Okay. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward to do. Um, okay. Then we have an outer loop and an inner loop. The outer loop, the sort of coarser step, is going to be sampling different values of the parameters using MCMC. We're going to compute different values. We're going to get a candidate, compute the posterior of a candidate, which will involve particle filtering on that value of theta to compute a value of a posterior given that value of theta, that candidate, that theta star. That's going to give us a value of P of theta star, the posterior at that candidate. Just like over here, all in. So we're drawing, we're getting a candidate theta star. We're computing particle filtering on it. And it turns out the byproducts of the particle filtering allow us to compute them together with, with some other things, like the prior. It allows us to compute the posterior at theta star. We're actually sampling from trajectory at the same time. Ah. OK, and so we get p of theta star, and we have p of theta. And same logic. We look at the ratio, and if p of theta star is greater than p of theta, we accept. And we output theta star, the, the parameters at that candidate. But we also output the trajectory that we sampled. By contrast, if we, if we don't accept it, maybe, maybe p of theta star is lower than p of theta. We don't accept it. We just repeat. We output p. Of, we output theta together with the trajectory sample plus time of theta. So here we're outputting values, tuples, drawing values of theta and trajectories, given that which are computed for that theta. And why? Because we're this is the posterior. It's posterior over theta and, and, and trajectory given the value of the observables. Eh? Huh? Yeah. So, so we're outputting these successively here. So the outer loop is just going through values of theta, which are, by the way, the parameters in the simulation model and others of them, like reporting rates and so on. We're going through these parameters and we're sampling a trajectory via particle filtering from them. And we are computing based on that, based on that, the values of the weights across all trajectories and particle filtering. In fact, we can compute the posterior of theta star. And we look at the ratio, we either accept or reject it each time. We accept it each time we're, we're emitting something. If we accept, we're emitting the theta star and 
the sample trajectory for that state of star. If we're staying in the same place, we're emitting theta in the trajectory previously sampled from it. And, and uh, we are each time <coughs> admitting both of those and then going on and considering you know, this, the, the, the new theta, the theta and, and continuing to consider other, other uh, candidates and so on. So we're, we're emitting these things here. And that gives us a joint distribution over theta and, and the trajectories. So we get, what are the trajectories? This sounds, this sounds weirdly disembodied, trajectories. What I'm talking about is some conjecture for what the system precisely did at each observation point, what were its values that it assumed of the underlying system, which we can't observe directly. Like how many people were truly sick at this time, or that time, or that time, or that time of the population. We don't have the luxury of observing that precisely. But we can output that true, uh, jointly with, with theta. Okay? Um, that's what PMCMC gives us. Um, okay. So this is written a little bit more formally here. But you'll recognize, I hope, your, 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 your um, old you know, elements of, of what you've been um, familiar with here, OK? Um, so uh, this theta, we've got to find an initial theta that gives us a non-zero um, posterior, OK? And this is the, the posterior here with the prior. Here's the, uh, the likelihood, and, um, and we, we want to take the, uh, the posterior value, OK? And we, we, we just kind of find one by kind of wandering around and getting it. Um, and, um, and then having gotten one, we go on and we generate this candidate. Now, this is something I didn't write in the PMC, in the MCMT thing. And I kind of got to come clean with you folks. So it turns out what I presented to you for MCMC was actually a pretty good version of MCMC. It was something called Metropolis Hastings algorithm for MCMC. And the general MCMC is, has some additional complexities with it um, that I glossed over. I specifically assumed that, that our, in finding a candidate value, we do so in some symmetric way around the current value. And what that leads to is these two terms with the Q canceling and the numerator and denominator there. And then you just have to uh, consider uh, these, these terms here in the PMCMC. Okay. Um, so uh, here we're comparing the values for the, the previous one with the values for the candidate, and we accept or reject. Okay. So this is. This is how PMCMC works, and it's outputting these joint values for these guys here. Now, time is, is, is a ticking, and I really want to get to op the opioid uh, example of this. Um, there's some details about sampling trajectories. It's pretty straightforward, but the basic idea is using the final weights, you can sample a point at the final time, and then you take its ancestors, you take its lineage, you take who is its mother, and who is that's mother, and who is that's mother, and you go back in time through successive resampling steps. I don't know if you remember from yesterday, I actually had an adapted version of this, but remember there's this resampling step that occurs in, in, in uh, particle filtering, where remember there's this um, uh, multiplication, uh, like things that are that are um, that have high weights, tend to multiply, um, be fruitful and multiply in the resampling step. Things that have low weights tend to die out. Um, so there's this survival of the fittest, and what that means is that each resampling step, after each resampling step, a given particle at a certain position comes from a mother in the previous. Uh, lifetime, probably a mother with a with a higher weight, and that mother comes in turn from a, a, a pre, uh, from a grandmother, and that grandmother from a great grandmother. Okay, so one begat the other, and it keeps on going on, uh, going back in time. So you can trace an ancestry over time 
whence a particle came, its lineage, its ancestral relationships. And sampling from a trajectory involves keeping track of this over all the different things. It's just a book, bookkeeping exercise in an ancestry matrix, and then there's an A matrix and an uh, ancestry matrix, and then there's a B, which, which tells us where things were at different times or what have you, and, and, and you basically can sample trajectories, okay? Um, you can sample from things here according to their weight, and then you trace back their whole trajectory. And this gives you a picture of what was going on at all different times of the model that observations were made. What was happening in the underlying situation in the model as posited by this particle? What was going on? And PMCMC gives you a chance to sample from that in light of parameter values. And out comes a joint picture, joint over thetas and underlying trajectories of the model that depict the history and the assumptions that gave rise to it. Okay, so, but I don't do this just because it's mathematically beautiful. I do this because I care about real world problems. And I'd like to show you a real, a real world example that needs something like this. Um, and this example I'll go through quickly because I want to get to the final issue of methodological choice. Okay, so um, this was a uh, this was a project which uh, we undertook uh, last year using data from outside of the country from Cincinnati that was shared with us uh, by uh, US side colleagues and as part of a wonderful conference that I'd recommend strongly to anyone here, SVP Brims. Okay, I'm gonna put it on the board because if you don't know about it, you should because all you folks would find the content really interesting and have a lot to learn, okay? It's SVP Brims and it will be um, going on in another three weeks or so. Um, I'll, uh, I'll even come up with the uh, SBP Brims uh, conference here. Okay, so it's social computer behavioral cultural modeling and prediction and behavioral representation modeling and simulation. And it's all about machine learning and big data and modeling as applied to real world problems um, in Washington, D.C. And this was presented here as an entry on their grand challenges. Um, and it has to do with this very serious epidemic of opioids that, is this, that has become the scourge of North America, with the US experiencing more deaths per year from opioids than from car accidents or guns, and with Canada having a devastating total uh, in terms of loss of lives, with, with particularly heavy loss of lives in uh, British Columbia by, by population. Um, this is an area where we are very fortunate to have backing for a provincial-wide analysis strategy led out of our lab for using tools like Particle MCMC, big data from Twitter, from online searches, uh, and from a wide variety of cross-sectoral uh, partners um, from the health, criminal justice, social services, education <coughs> side bringing data to bear to help us understand the hidden, the hidden features of this epidemic, understand the complex interaction of health, social services, justice, corrections, and policing, um, and to make sure we don't, again, undertake actions which, which uh, try to attack the problem here and cause all sorts of problems over there, okay? Um, so um, we approach this with a, a Markov chain Monte Carlo, and I want to thank Jushin Liu, who in countless hours helped, um, helped me really grok what, what's going on with PMCMC, um, and jointly worked to apply it to, uh, uh, to, to uh, Dunning's model. Um, so there's a wide variety of past uh, models that have been contributed in this area, but a lot of them really fallen short because they fall quickly out of, uh, they fall quickly obsolete. 
Uh, and they haven't worked to really integrate the implications of evidence from the world. At best, maybe some calibration or some machine learning estimates without dynamic modeling, but this really, this really um, requires a, a full-scale model to take most advantages of it. Now, the goals here reflected the context. Um, first of all, there's a lot of data related to certain things, like opioid prescriptions, related to deaths or occurrences of, of reported uh, overdoses. Um, but there's a big gate of gaps, such as around illegal trade. There's a lot that's just not observed in terms of illegally sourced drugs, or even in terms of like diverted drugs, theft. Theft is a big issue for opioids. You know, grandkids who rob grandma's medicine cabinet and take the opioids and share them with friends. People who, who are on opioids for chronic pain and sell some of them to others to try to help, help uh, make ends meet in terms of their financial situation. This goes on a lot, and there's very little data on that. So data, yes, but also a model that represent, captures the fact there's a lot of missing data, and that we need to make the most of the data that we have. There's also a rapidly changing set of features of the opioid epidemic. The opioid epidemic, I first started working in opioids. My students know this, but I first started doing work in this area in 2000, 2001. My work was actually the subject. It was perhaps the first big data science work on it. And we were harvesting from the sort of proto-internet, actually. Internet kind of came out of MIT, so I had been using it for a long time then, and ARPANET and so on. But it was really one of the first times that data harvesting had been done on social discussions involving um, big health issues there. We were harvesting from a system known as Usenet, which probably you folks won't remember, maybe Wade will remember Usenet. Um, it's kind of the, the dark underbelly of the internet these days with, with lots and lots of illegal drug trade, et cetera, on it. But we were harvesting information back in 2000. It actually became the subject of US Senate testimony during our results, which is, is, is kind of amazing. Anyway, um, we were looking, um, we want to capture the fact that the opioid epidemic has evolved enormously since that time. Back then, it was about Oxycontin, hydrocodone, and, these, and Percocet, and these early substances, which we revealed um, abuse patterns for in a growing epidemic back in 2000, 2001. These days, a lot of it is also, it, that's still present, but a lot of it is about fentanyl and adulterated substances and increasingly car fentanyl on the West Coast and mail order availability of drugs and pill presses and, and huge chronic pain um, diversion and, and, and delivery of opioids, et cetera. And so we wanted a model that could learn from evidence, could learn about changing patterns. Say, have evolving parameter values. We need to anticipate coming trends and to evaluate policy scenarios. And for this, we turn to PMCMC. And so what we basically had here was a fairly articulated model. Shayan probably remembers this fondly. Um, an articulated model which involved uh, individuals who were encountering opioids through several different pathways, through chronic pain pathways, um, with unmanaged chronic pain, um, individuals who had never been disordered, those with a, with a current prescription um, but are, are, are not predisposed, but they have chronic pain, and they're at risk of getting uh, addicted, but they're clean. They're not getting opioids from the street. And then these individuals who progress on to, um, to a disordered state, um, uh, taking, um, taking opioids, there's um, a possibility that a person will cease uh, using, um, using opioids, um, uh, but, but do so from a, a, a disordered uh, state here. Um, individuals can also proceed to getting drugs from dealers and can potentially 
uh, get from, um, from dealers through purely recreational uses as well. Um, there's treatment uh, stages here, um, and there's a, a, a separate set of pathways for those who are predisposed because of past trauma or other reasons towards opioid risks and a risk of death associated with opioid use, which is particularly strong, uh, particularly from dealer source, because of the uh, varying availability, the dynamics of tolerance within a person, the ability to tolerate opioids, and um, the various dosing that's available. I will note that this model is actually a stratified model, meaning it's actually got three additional dimensions by tolerance level of an individual, whether they have more tolerance or less. As their level of consumption goes up, they build up a tolerance, which means they need more drugs to achieve the same bang. And they will often lead them to, um, to illegally source drug. They have a chronic pain status and a history as to whether they've been disordered before and are therefore more likely to fall back into it. Um, so this is a particle MCMC model. So this was running in a particle filtered way within a particle MCMC context, within, remember, within particle MCMC, we have this um, inner loop, which is uh, particle filtering. And so we had these particles running through this with these different hypotheses. And we're running this model again and again and again for different values of the parameters, okay? Um, and there's a survival of the fittest occurring, but we're sampling from parameter values as well for less well-known parameters, particularly related to disordered individuals, et cetera. I, excuse me, um, 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 dealer-sourced drugs. And we had a variety of drugs, which are drugs, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> there are not drugs put into this model. We had a variety of data um, that uh, we, we leveraged uh, for this model. And each of those data sources related to different places in this model. This is this whole thing I was telling you about my stance about, look, I, I, systems competent data science. Data doesn't come out of a vacuum. Data comes from, from different places in real world systems. So when data comes from the same system, there's got to be an underlying picture that makes sense of that make sense of those different faces of the same underlying system. And they can jointly leverage those. So we had data from a wide variety of sources. Some of this was traditional data, like police calls related to uh, drug complaints, um, EMS responses related to opioid overdoses, um, uh, opioid prescription um, counts, for example, for this area, and drug overdose deaths available through CDC, uh, U.S. Centers for Disease Control type of systems. But we also had a set of intriguing data related to Google Trends. And this included um, uh, data related to searching on certain topics, searching out information on the dark web, which is a source of a lot of illegally sourced drugs now, um, uh, on naloxone or Narcan. This is uh, um, for, for uh, opioid overdose prevention, uh, drug rehab options, and for back pain. We also were starting to look into, but we didn't actually incorporate in this, in Twitter mining. And um, the, the system that UN has built up as far as uh, Twitter mining, and that was pioneered early on uh, by Li Xiaoyan um, for, uh, for understanding Twitter data related to um, uh, to, to uh, communicable diseases. Um, I have a strong interest in bringing this in, but the basic picture is that each of these data sources relates to a different piece of the system, some to flows within the system, some to stocks in the state of the system directly, some to flows implied by that state. Um, and some of these trend data re uh, uh, relate to other pieces of it. And we have likelihood functions that I don't have time to go into that relate each of these to the underlying state of this model. Okay, now remember the idea with particle filtering, and by extension particle MCMC even more strongly, is that you might have data from one piece of the system, but because of the logic of the model, the logic of the connectivity, it tells you something about the broader features of the model. It illuminates areas around it in the model. 
It's the logic of the situation. It's like if, uh, the argument I had yesterday. If we saw a stream, a huge stream of people pulling in from that door, I don't know for sure what's going on out there. I just see this flow of people, just like I might see this flow. But if I keep on seeing that over several minutes, it tells me there were a lot of people out there a few minutes ago. You know, there were, there were a whole lot of people out there. Either they were moving in to this whole floor very quickly or they were crowded out there. But it clues me into what's going on through the door. Is that data about what's out there? No. All I see is that. But it tells me about what's going on out there a lot. The fact that no one has come in that door, well, okay, maybe one person. It tells me there's probably, there's less likely to be a big crowd out there right now. Um, and here, what we're getting out of each data source by the logical model that illuminated different pieces. Once you start piecing, putting in this data from many areas of the model, it starts eliminating broader areas, particularly looking for dark web related information, drug rehab options. It starts to eliminate areas where we have very little actual um, good data, which is uh, related to dealer sourcing. Deaths from opioids also give that because these deaths are predominantly occurring from um, opioid uh, users in either this state or this stage or, or this state here. Um, they have to come from one of those two states and so if we start seeing a lot of deaths it tells us something about uh, people upstream. Okay, um, And we have a variety of, of, of likelihood uh, functions. Um, we, we use this model to then try to make sense of the evidence um, to test the model's depiction about what's going on over time and seeing how well it, it could account for the data that we see. Sometimes it did better, sometimes less, less well. I'd say overall, it was a good first approximation. And this, um, you, you notice this kind of uh, green and brown around these points. This kind of gives where it's a high posterior density region or a low posterior density region as informed by the data. This is an area that didn't do so well. This was a bit too narrow. We need to look into this. Some of them hug these, um, these points of evidence pretty strongly. So we tried, to, we tried to test it against here. We have latent stocks, which are about pieces of the system. We don't have data directly. And this is telling us the model what it thinks is going on here with respect to these items, including drug dealer sourced items, etc. And these are some MCMC parameters, which uh, lack uh, finesse and beauty at an aesthetic level, but have a certain conceptual beauty um, that I, I, I view highly. Um, we also had prediction going on. So remember, once you estimate whether a particle filtering a particle in CMC, the current state of the system probabilistically, you can project forward. And, um, and so here we blinded the model to data after a certain time, and we predicted forward what the system would do. So this data wasn't used to inform the model. Rather, we informed it up to here in a sort of cross-validation scheme, and then we projected forward. Uh, this is actually the projection forward up here. Um, and it captured a lot of the features, although it has fairly broad uncertainty and growing uncertainty. Just like if I started here and you put a blindfold over me for the first you know, 30 seconds, I'd be pretty sure about where I was, and then I'd be increasingly unsure, hence the growing envelope. These are intervention results. These are, given where we're at, given where we've been, what's likely going to happen if we undertake certain interventions within the system? To what degree can we bend the curve relative to what would have happened? And I have other slides on this, but I want to get into the methodological choices. So, you know, broad findings here. Um, we actually have a, a short paper related to this. MCMC offers a promising means for creating these self-learning models, um, combining uh, high, high density data, high velocity data with machine learning. It, it can allow for, for effective estimation of system state allow for projection forward and assessing intervention trade-offs. And there's a lot of additional investigation and parallelization that's needed. This model that we have here will be seeing new light shortly because of this large-scale collaboration 
being launched. It's actually going through order and council right now at the um, at the legislature, the provincial legislature, for this big scale initiative center on opioids and other drug abuse here in the province, leveraging tools like this, social media mining, and, and many others, okay? Um, so that was a bit of a glimpse of that. I apologize for the uh, brevity of it, but I'm just going to hit on one or two more, more items here. First of all, I would like to just note that I will share with you a beautiful presentation created by uh, Tianyuan here on um, uh, classifying um, uh, Twitter data. Um, uh, this provides some significant guidance and, and sort of points of learning um, in terms of how one can use Twitter data um, in a machine learning context to, uh, with label data being used uh, for the basis of, of labeling, of, of um, classification schemes that are that can then be automatic um, using machine learning models. It basically involved training data set and prediction data set, successive stages of filtering things out to keep the burden less, um, uh, labeling of tweets manually as to whether they were, uh, they, they met a specific criteria uh, of, excuse me, describing uh, plausible influenza cases, something that Zuru will be doing shortly with opioids, um, uh, based on some guidance from, from me. Uh, we manually labeled the tweets, and uh, there was some filtering out due to presence of, of keywords. Um, and these are some examples of, of tweets that, that were considered valid cases, and some <coughs> cases some that were not, even though they mentioned influenza. For example, public service announcements, while nice and germane to influenza, are not about cases. These are about cases on Twitter. Okay? Um, so there's a training data set. Um, huge amount of work went into this by Tian Yuan. And very recently, we've had a whole battery of people in the lab. I believe I can hold up Wade and Jenna and several others maybe here. Um, who, who are also part of this initiative of classifying tweets, receiving how many per day? Uh, I think the over 6,000. 6, overall. Yeah, over and how many per person, how many do they get per day? Uh, per day going to be 100. 100 to classify. Yeah. And then we were looking at the same tweet as classified by different individuals to look at the level of inter-rater reliability. To what degree this tweet was um, was uh, consistently labeled by multiple multiple people? Um, ah, okay. So now it it uh, it, it couldn't last. Um, uh, its throat may be hurting as well. Um, so um, so we uh, did labeling. We got um, positives and negatives and. Uh, UN trained a bunch of um, uh, types of models um, uh, for, for classification. It's notable that this pipeline involved a set of stages taking the, the tweet text, tokenizing it into individual words, um, removing very common words. There is also a component here, um, I'm trying to remember which step it's in, of stemming words so that if a given word um, uh, was used, it sort of abstracts away for, for example, the, the tense of the word, or whether it's plural or singular. Um, it, it shops off gerunds or whatever, ing at the end. So it canonicalizes it, recognizing it's the same word, you know, um, regardless of ending. Um, that's that's a, a, a part of this. I can't remember the, the formal stage it's in. Feature extraction from this, so there's a vector of words that are created, counting the number of, of, of times a given word occurs in a tweet uh, in a classification. This initial um, classification didn't really make use of emoticons or, um, or uh, features like whether it was a retweet, et cetera. Um, we're hoping to make stronger use of those in the future. Um, some of those are captured, some are not captured, and we, we need to do so. Um, oh, uh, six seconds. Um, 
Okay, so anyway, we, we, uh, UN got uh, some very acceptable uh, ROC curves out of this, particularly for a logistic regression classifier. Um, uh, but um, uh, this was looking at the effects of a classification threshold on, on recall sensitivity. Um, I don't have time to go into this uh, any further, but I'll provide you some slides so you can look at it. Yuan here is the expert on what was done and the pipeline, and Zuru here in the front also has done some excellent work in updating this, or this work to work with um, uh, additional uh, survey monkey type mechanisms um, and uh, and is going to be taking it forward for the case of opioid uh, opioid abuse where there is surprising levels of online discussion so I'd like to uh, to point to their work the final thing I'm just going to say and um, I'm gonna have to literally seed the podium and in, in uh, just uh, two or three minutes here is that um, uh, I've put together a guide for methodology selection. So you've heard from me um, a, a dizzying amount of information of different techniques. Particle filtering, HMMs, particle MCMC, MCMC, all these different techniques. And I wanted to give you some sort of guide for when you might, you know, might use one or the other, right? And broadly, I would say, look, do you have theory <clears throat> about your system? If you have theory about your system, theory about the mechanics of it, and you're interested in it, dynamics over time, dynamic models are, are of the sort we've seen, whether it's system dynamics or agent-based or discrete about, they're pretty important. And look, if, if you're seeking to understand what the underlying situation is, uh, particularly in a, in a stochastic system, um, uh, and to understand the latent states of that system, filtering is what you want to do. And there's many types of filtering, uh, including Coleman filtering and particle filtering and other variants. Um, and I'll get to those in a minute. But if you just have cross-sectional data points, you don't have data over time, you might just want to consider calibrating your model. Um, if you're trying to estimate poorly or unknown parameter values, um, uh, or, or uh, to estimate latent state. If, if the parameter values are changing over time, they're stochastic, you can use particle filtering. If by contrast you want to estimate static parameter values and latent state of the model, PMCMC is really what you have to, have to do. If, if you want to sample from those values, you don't want just, um, uh, you, you want to sample uh, distributions from the values, if you have a deterministic system without a lot of stochastics, MCMC will do uh, a good job. If you have a stochastic system, PMCMC is really, really what you need. If you're just seeking a single best estimate, calibration can do fine. Um, if you are um, trying to inform parameter values uh, based on collected data, um, based on, on small um, subparts of a system, traditional parameter estimation techniques can be appropriate. If you don't have, a, if you don't have theory underlying your, your, your sense of the system, you might consider deep learning to capture this, the salient empirical regularities, capture essentially in a curve fitting type fashion until you can develop such, uh, such theory. Um, it might show important relationships. And we use deep learning a lot with like image recognition or audio recognition to very good effects. Um, if you're trying to assess the presence of causal relationships um, between factors, I'd use another technique, which I haven't talked about here, but which you'll find me describing online, uh, CCM, which is just great to use with, um, with uh, large quantities of time series data. Filtering methods, um, we choose them based on context, but if you have discrete states, you know, categorical or nominal states, sitting, standing, lying down versus off person, or you know, uh, inside, outside, or on vehicle, off vehicle, or what have you, hidden markup modeling is a great solution. And you can use it with particle filtering, actually, if you want to do so. Most of the time we use it in a, um, in a fashion which um, uh, is simpler than that with, with calculating probabilities. You can use it with particle filtering. You can also do MCMC with it which is an interesting thing rather than arriving at point estimates with MLE type methods, maximum likelihood estimation for parameter values. 
for continuous state, particle filtering and particle on CMC can estimate continuous state. If you need to estimate with filtering plausibly or clearly static parameters, MCMC is it can be a good uh, good technique. And Kalman filtering, um, if you have very fast computation needs. Okay, um, uh, I could call I could comment more on MCMC, but basically you can draw values for joint distributions for for parameters. It doesn't tend to work very well for stochastic models. Uh, in principle, you can use it to select in a Bayesian way from different models. That gets into a very sophisticated area of what's called reverse jump MCMC, particularly when the models have different parameter spaces, different parameters associated with them. You want to do, if you want to do model selection, which model do I want to use? Do I want to put my eggs all in the basket of one model or several different models? It can get quite hairy if you have different parameter spaces. If you have similar parameter spaces, it's a lot, lot easier. Um, I don't know as, as much as I should about that. Liu Zhu Shen, is, uh, Dr. Liu, is, the, uh, is, is a very good person to, to talk to about that. Um, it, it seems that it hasn't worked so well in practice. Um, OK, that's all I have time for. I've overextended my time and quite probably overextended your patience. So I want to thank you very much for all of your um, attention, all of your uh, 